<laughs> Good evening, and welcome to the historical Wilmington Historical Society's third presentation. Our first two, uh, the first one was uh, Santa's Workshop at Santa's Workshop in conjunction with Arch. Uh, the second one was uh, about uh, the influence of postcards on tourism. And this is our third one, which is where uh, men and mountain meet. And um, and I would like to uh, say a couple of things about safety and that kind of thing first. Uh, we have two exits. You know, it's a small room, but I still have to say it. There are two exits, any emergency, we can pick one. And then um, the other thing is we have uh, our membership brochures. If you haven't become a member, but would like to become a member, we have membership brochures back there. We're also doing um, our annual gift card basket raffle. Um, and uh, that's back there with Judy. Judy is back there with with that. And um, I have, I oh, I didn't give you the Zettel because I'm, yeah, I have it. It's hang on. I'll get it for you. Hang on. It's here. There you go. I know that's one thing I have to keep. Yeah. So the reason I just did that was because you can also purchase them um with credit cards. <laughs> so so you don't need mm -hmm. cash. Um and we have uh, other program, another program coming up, and you know, the Festival of Colors, and and tomorrow, uh, for all of those volunteers, all of the people who volunteered at one time or another uh, for the Wilmington Historical Society, we have our Volunteer Appreciation Day tomorrow at five thirty at the Wilmington Town Beach. We're having an ice cream social provided by uh, Stewarts. They're providing all the ice cream for our ice cream social at five thirty at the beach. And you can stay uh, if you would like and uh, be there for the concert as well. So, and it's going to be a nice day tomorrow. So uh, please come uh, to our, <laughs> uh, to, our um, to our first, it's our first volunteer appreciation event. So uh, we thought we, we really needed to do that. We're starting to gain more and more volunteers, especially after last year's, you know, bicentennial. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, let you know that we appreciate we appreciate all of you very much. So, um, without uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker is uh, actually he and I <laughs> went to the same college at almost the same time. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we have to, we have the same. <clears throat> we're both alumni of uh, SUNY Oswego. So. Um, First of all, uh, Glenn moved to Johnsburg, New York from Long Island in June of 1964, age 15 with his parents and graduated from Johnsburg Central School in North Creek in June of 1967. Uh, he graduated with a BA in English and unofficial minor in philosophy from the State University of New York <laughs> in June of 1971. Um, he has written several books. Uh, one of them is Echoes in These Mountains in 2008. The second book, When Men and Mountains Meet, which is what we're discussing tonight. Uh, Leaves Torn Asunder uh, is another uh, another uh, history of Johnsville. Um, his research on historic topics has appeared in many national newspapers, including several mentions in the New York Times. His articles also regularly appear in the Adirondack Almanac, which is where I read him from originally, uh, and the New York State History Blog. Uh, in 2000, Glenn and his wife, Carol, created and funded a private foundation dedicated to improving the life of year-round residents of the Adirondack Park. Uh, Glenn recently retired as Senior Vice President in UBS uh, Wealth Management Division and as a Senior Portfolio Manager working out of the UBS office in Glens Falls. He and his wife, Carol, live near the base of Crane Mountain in the northwest corner of Warren County. So that's just over the board. Okay. Um, Without further ado, um, we would like to have you start your talk on where men and mountains meet. Good. Thank, Thank you, you, Karen. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, being here tonight, uh, taking your time to explore some aspects of Adirondack history you may not be quite aware of. Uh, I, I have served on uh, not-for-profits and historical societies for many years was on the board of the Adirondack Museum for nine years. 
And, you know, when you think about the history of the Adirondacks, you typically think about the great camps. That's the image that comes to mind. Uh, the twin furniture, uh, perhaps the history of an environmental movement. But no one has really talked about some of the fascinating things that were happening in the Adirondacks immediately after the American Revolution. Most of these efforts began with great hope. Most all of them ended in despair. I will reference one case that ended in suicide. It's always been tough to do well in the Adirondacks. And I've been told that this book helps fill a, a void in Adirondack literature. Uh, so I will enjoy sharing uh, some of these stories with you tonight. I don't know, we're gonna try to pop this up a little bit for you. Uh, this is, uh, we're gonna talk first what the Adirondacks were like before the American Revolution. Of course, they weren't even known, they weren't named the Adirondacks. It was just the great Northern wilderness. And you probably can't see this too well in the area that uh, uh, we know the Adirondacks are, but this is a map drawn by a British military engineer, 1756. And inside that, where you see the Adirondacks today, he says, this country by reason of mountains, swamps and drowned lands is impassable and uninhabited. <laughs> and uh, it certainly was even in 1756. Here is another map of about that time. And you'll see the compass direction there to the left. They say this country belongs to the Oneidas. Mm -hmm. And to the right, boundary of New York, closed portion of it, this country belongs to the Mohawks. Mm -hmm. And I'll be talking a little bit about the conflict between those two first peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, as an aside, during the American Revolution, most of the Iroquois nation down by the Finger Lakes sided with the British. They had fought with the British during the French Indian War. They stayed with the British during the American Revolution. The exception was the Oneida tribe. For whatever reason, they decided to back the Patriots. And in return, the American government promised them the lands of the Adirondacks if they won. And of course they won, but then the American government ignored their promise and gave the money to military pensioners. Here is a breakdown of some of the various tribes in the area. This is from Jerry Jenkins' book, The Adirondack Atlas. Uh, if you've not seen that, I highly recommend it to you. It's filled with some fascinating information. Uh, but uh, you had the Iroquois people and so on and so forth, but things were in a state of flux and the Adirondacks in the 1600s were basically a battle zone, a war zone, <laughs> between the Algonquin-speaking tribes to the north, up towards Canada, uh, and the Iroquois nation to the south. And what they were fighting over was the beaver trade, because beavers became very valuable for export to Europe. The Algonquin tribes wanted to... Go back again? Yeah. Okay. Uh, wanted to take the beavers down the St. Lawrence through Montreal and Canada to export. And Sir William Johnson, who was an Englishman in Johnstown, tried to get to try through the Iroquois nations of Finger Lake, Sonida Lake, and going down the Hudson to New York City. And this caused a great conflict between those tribes. Yes. It's possible to get in the lights. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I'm not sure how. Oh, I should have said in my introduction as well, we're a small enough group that if you do have a question, just raise your hand. I'll be happy to qualify you uh, and share with you the answer if I know it. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll just make something up. <laughs> yeah, seriously. If, if, we don't, if we don't have the information, I'll try to find it for you. But this is a breakdown of those various tribes that I referenced in the Beaver Wars of the 1600s. If you spend any time on Lake Champlain, this is Split Rock, just south of Essex, New York. And this was the traditional borderland between the Algonquin tribes from Canada to the north and the Iroquois to the south. And it's a, you know, a, a landmark that just kind of jumps out at you. Uh, so it will be a natural place for people familiar with the land and kind of draw a line in the sand and you stay on your side and I'll, and I'll stay on my side. But that didn't quite work out that way. 
in July 29th, 1609, Samuel D. Champlain and 11 men sided with some Algonquin Indians. They headed south down Champlain, the lake, of course, named for Samuel D. Champlain. And they went south of this point into the lands that were theoretically Iroquois uh, to where the uh, river from Ticonderoga empties into Lake Champlain, the Shoot River. And they kind of shot at each other. And they were first starting with arrows, and then behind the Algonquin-speaking people came Samuel Johnson with his 11 men, and it was the first time that gunpowder was used. And they immediately shot three of the uh, Algonquin chiefs, and or actually the Algonquin shot three of the Iroquois chiefs there, and the Iroquois were totally terrified. They had never seen anything like this before. And that created the seeds for hundreds of years of wars between the Iroquois and the Algonquin speaking people. It also introduced gunpowder to and guns to that conflict. So the casualties were much higher, much worse than they had been in the past. So the Adirondacks continued to be a war zone and actually it kicked it up a notch or two. By the mid 1700s, we were in the midst of the French and Indian War. And if you're familiar with all with Fort Ticonderoga, Fort William Henry, uh, you're kind of familiar with the French and Indian War. Uh, I always tell when I speak to the classrooms or some of the eighth graders, it was not a war between the French and the Indians. Uh, it was the French and Indians against the British Americans and the Iroquois nation. And here is just a list of some of the fortifications in New York State during the French Indian War. And you'll recognize several of those. Fort Oswego, of course, Karen and I would be yep. familiar with. <laughs> Fort Stanwix, which is uh, in Rome. Uh, you have Fort Frederick, Fort Ticonderoga, Fort William Henry, mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy Harry. I mean, they're all in this area. This area was the hotbed during the French Union War. So the Adirondacks, as pristine and beautiful as we see them today, continue to be a war zone. Mm -hmm. Next, we had 20, 25 years later, the American Revolution breaks out. We're in the midst of the war zone again. And uh, I'd like to read a little bit from the book explaining how difficult it was in New York at that time. The casualty list of Americans killed in the American Revolution is modest by contemporary standards. Approximately 50,000 Americans were killed or wounded. But those members belie the horror of those eight years, especially in New York State. In New York, the war was as much a civil war as it was a rebellion. Many favored staying with the crown, others sought independence, still others just didn't want to get involved. Towns and families throughout the state fought against each other and did so with cruelty and vengeance. The settlements along the Hudson River Valley, including northern Westchester County, Dutchess County, and rural Albany County, and several northeast counties would become Vermont, which would become Vermont, supported revolution. New York City and the three counties that comprise Staten Island, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, with their commercial ties to London, were the loyalists, the greatest stronghold on the continent. Areas between were divided, as were many families within those areas. The settlers of the Mohawk Valley were particularly at risk. Settlers, local patriots on one side, and loyalists on the other. Both New Yorkers fought one, fought one of the most horrific battles of the war at Ariscity Falls near Rome. No other state suffered more for the cause of independence than did New York. Its frontiers blazed constantly in guerrilla warfare. Armies marched and countermarched up and down the principal rivers and valleys, strewing death and destruction behind them. Nearly one third of the engagements of the war were fought on New York soil. New York City, which controlled most of the com commerce of the state, was continuously in enemy hands from 1776 to 1783. Two major fires destroyed many buildings in the great seaport. After British evacuation, the population of the city of New York fell to 10,000, half of what it had been on the eve of the revolution. 
There were no major battles fought in the heart of the Adirondack Mountains. The capture of Ticonderoga, the important battle of Saratoga, and the naval battle at Vancouver, Vancouver Island on Lake Champlain were fought in the foothills or periphery of the mountains. Still, during the war, the Adirondack region was again a contested land, an area much to be feared and avoided. <clears throat> the winds of war swirled around and through the Adirondacks. War parties traveled through these mountains and made fearful raids on each other's towns and settlements, burning homes, farms, killing inhabitants. Warriors traveled up and down the Mohawk River, along the shores of Lake Champlain and Lake George, up and down the Oswegatchie Trail, which ran from the Carrion Place at Fort Stanwix in Rome, up the Boonville Gorge, down the Black, Indian, and Oswegatchie Rivers to the St. Lawrence. There was a spur off this trail that ran near Boonville, across Trenton, and down West Canada Creek, and the German Flats at Herkimer. Sir John Johnson followed a series of trails that ran from the Indian village near today's Fonda, to the Sacandaga River, and from there either headed to the Racket River, to the St. Lawrence, at the Indian Reservation of the St. Regis, or a route that ran from the Sacandaga along the west side of Crane Mountain, to the Scrood River, and then to Boaga Bay on Lake Champlain. Ten months before official independence was declared, an attack was launched along the eastern mm -hmm. edge of the Adirondacks against the northern frontier royal to Great Britain. Montreal was captured and later lost by General Gurry and a rebel army of 1,700 area militiamen. The failure of that attack opened the door for retaliatory attacks from Canada. Sir John Johnson, son of the then deceased Sir William Johnson, chose to remain loyal to the Crown. In 1777, he participated in an attack on Fort Stanwix, Rome. In 1780, John Johnson led the King's Royal Regiment which you see here, this is actually a monument in Ontario, Canada, uh, consisting of loyals from New York State, from Wago Bay on Lake Champlain, down an old Indian trail through the Adirondack Wilderness, past Crane Mountain in Northeast Warren County. Mm -hmm. The goal was his former hometown of Johnstown. Johnson and his men, accompanied by Indians, attacked at midnight. Local Tories who had early warning of the raid assisted them. Farmers and settlers who supported the Patriot cause were systematically killed. Johnson's men went on a rampage, burning 120 barns, mills, and houses. In October of that year, Captain Moreau led a raiding, Tory raiding party south. His original target was Schenectady, but finding that too well defended, he attacked the area around Boston Spa. Today, that area is still called Burnt Hills. Major Christopher Carlton and his Tory raiders coming through the Adirondacks from Lake Champlain also attacked and burned the settlements of Kingsbury and Queensbury near Glens Falls. So it was this was a nasty place to be, is my wow. point. This was a this was an again quite a beautiful mm -hmm. scenic area. This was a place of terror. Now after the Treaty of Paris. In 1783, the uh, war had ended. But although the United States was politically independent, it was not economically independent. And entrepreneurs look at a map of the Adirondacks, which have been, except for military excursions up and down the valleys and along the rivers, really had not been explored, uh, saw an opportunity. This is an, a time period when people traveled by water. And if you look at the map of the Adirondacks, you've got Lake Champlain and Lake George on the east. To the south, you've got the Mohawk River, you've got Oneida Lake, which feeds into Seneca Lake, leads into uh, the Oswego River, into Lake Ontario to the west. And then you've mm -hmm. got the St. Lawrence to the north. So this area was surrounded, surrounded by water at the time. And the masters of the universe of their day, as I say, sought to explore and exploit it. And in my research, I came across 13 different historic sites where this happened. I'm not gonna cover all 13 tonight. We don't have the time for that. But each ended in hope, uh, it began in hope and ended in despair. Responding. There we go. Uh, the most ambitious of all those plans uh, 
started at the time of the French Revolution, which of course soon followed the American Revolution. The Royalists were afraid uh, during the terror in Paris and in the hinterlands of France, they were literally going to lose their heads. Mm -hmm. So they founded a consortium called the New York Company, and their plan was to buy northern New York, most of the Adirondacks, and convert it to a French feudal estate <laughs> where these royalists would parade around and go hunting and so forth, and the Americans would be the peasants who would okay. take care of everything. Now, the New York Company, in 1792, contracted for 630,000 acres in the Adirondacks. The next year, they hired two surveyors, a Pierre Ferrault and a Simon de Chardin, to kind of check it out. And they sailed up the Hudson River uh, with a few men, and then they headed west, the Mohawk River, to what was called the Carrying Place. So that's where Fort Stanwix is today, in Rome, New York. That was strategically important. So they would carry their things over and go into a Nida Lake. Mm -hmm. And from there, they would head to Night Lake down the Oswego River into the wild waters of Lake Ontario. And they were just in large dugout canoes. And if you've ever spent time on Lake Ontario, you might get it you know, pretty rough. And then they're going to head up the Black River to the area that you see here, uh, just to the center, a little above a caster land. Uh, that was the area that they were going to develop, start this, this large feudal estate. And I'm just going to read one more thing from the book here to do this castor line justice. Castor coming from the oils that come from a fever. One of the most ambitious plans for the settlement and development of the Adirondack wilderness immediately following the American Revolution lay in the western Adirondacks along the Black River Valley near today's Lowville. Plans called for two European-style cities with formal gardens, libraries, museums, and theaters, and broad avenues leading to 14,000 subdivided lots at a time when the population of the booming city of Albany was less than 3,500. <laughs> the plan was the brainchild of a group of French aristocrats in Paris covered a vast tract of the Western Adirondacks, which they called Casterland. The year was 1793. It had been 10 years since peace was declared between Great Britain and the former colonies. 1793. Now, if we look at the, the next picture here, it, it's a little hard to read because of the, like the shade, but they wound up owning a lot less land than they thought they'd bought. They were pretty sure they bought at least 230 acres in the first installment. Turned out to be only 180,000 acres. Uh, still a big piece of land, but it was two parcels that weren't even contiguous to each other. I mean, they were dealing with, with not much information about kind of, kind of what they bought. And part of their plan was to create this European style city is they would have ocean going vessels sail up the Black River. <laughs> and if you look at the Black River, is known for its waterfall. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't even know there were waterfalls. Okay. Uh, they really dealt with a, a lack of information. Uh, in fact, one of the surveyors actually drowned at this point. The other thing I found fascinating was that the French instructions were so specific, they micromanaged this, that they told them exactly where to build the roads, exactly. And if any of you were from Rome, New York, or going north of Rome, New York, towards, uh, I'm kidding, 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 pardon? No, not that far, just, to, just about 10 miles north of Utica and Rome. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't believe I can't remember it, but anyway. Hey, no, I'm pretty sure it's been there. Really? No. 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 <laughs> well, anyway. Anyway, they uh, if you go up there, they have a road called the French Road. 
And this is perfectly straight. And while they were cutting the road and surveying it, they came to a cliff <laughs> because the engineers in France didn't know nothing about the topography here. But they were loyal to those instructions. So they climbed down around the cliff and then continued cutting the road straight. <laughs> <laughs> a little case of over management here. I'm sorry if I missed this, but who did they purchase this from? Uh, they that's it. They probably purchased it. See, this would be after the war. So they would probably purchase it for the state of New York. And I'll tell them more about the problems of purchasing things for the state of New York later. <laughs> uh, they had paid uh, uh, $1.48 an acre, but attempts to settle it, it floundered. They wound up selling a lot of the property at a loss. Then in 1802, Napoleon took over France and he pardoned all the royalists that were thinking about coming to the United States to escape, so mm -hmm. they didn't leave. So things floundered even more. And the only real reminder, if you drive through the Adirondacks, is this little town of Casterland, population of 340. Wow. <laughs> On to our next site. Uh, this is one of the more fascinating people I came across is uh, James Leray um, in Paris. He was a very prosperous merchant. And his wife married into the Queen's retinue in, in France. And he set himself as the King's agent. He was the financial agent. And he got a percentage of everything. So he became enormously wealthy. He had a chateau outside of Versailles. And when Ben Franklin and others came to negotiate the peace uh, to end the American Revolution, they stayed at his house. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Franklin brought to him a young sea captain by the name of John Paul Jones mm -hmm. and said, can we raise a little money to give this guy a boat <laughs> <laughs> so he can at attack the British? And James Murray went over and wrote a check. He says, by the fleet. Wow. So this guy, this guy was pretty wealthy. Uh, and he's sometimes called the father to the American Revolution because he he personally, or with the Treasury of France, uh, bankroll uh, the mm. Patriot cause. We'll go to the next picture. Okay. Um, he was he took over a lot of the debts and the lands of Casterland when it failed. And um, bought additional land, so he personally owned 350,000 acres, which included much of Lewis, Jefferson, Franklin, and St. Lawrence counties. Mm -hmm. St. Lawrence County alone is bigger than the state of Rhode Island, incidentally. Mm -hmm. And he built this mansion, which exists to this day. Mm -hmm. It's on the grounds of Fort Drum in Watertown, and you can mm -hmm. actually go and see it. It's considered an architectural masterpiece. It's used today for special events. And I was honored to be given a, a tour through it. Um, and it was quite humbling to see this thing. But it was really neat as a tangent. It had an internal water system, which was very unusual in those days, with wooden water pipes. <laughs> they got logs, they would drill a hole through the center and connect these logs. And that was the, how they got the pipe they did themselves. Did he stay there? He stayed there. That was his camp. <laughs> he spent up most of his time still in Paris. Next, we see some the silverware that was in the mansion that's still in display there. So this was not a rustic little abode where one thinks of houses in the Adirondacks in the 1790s. Mm -hmm. Next is a, a letter I was able to find uh, with his signature on it, uh, where he explains how he hopes to develop the uh, area. And his last name, actually in France, was Chaumont, S-C-H-A-U-M-O-N-T. Uh, there's a town in, in Western New York by that name. And that was because that was the name of his estate just outside of Versailles. Mm -hmm. And the French would use D, and then the name of the place they were from. So that's how he signed it. Now he uh, he 
personally and with the Treasury of France, loaned all sorts of money to the American government to win the war. He won the war. He expected to be paid back. Well, they paid it back in depreciated currency. You probably heard the saying, not worth a continental. Yep. What they paid it back with was just about <laughs> useless. At the same time, uh, funding our revolution ruined the economy of France. We always hear about uh, Marie Antoinette saying, you know, let them eat cake. Well, the French up to that time subsidized the price of flour because their government was in such a deficit, they could no longer subsidize the price of flour. That was the trigger to the French Revolution. Mm. Uh, let's see what I can say. Oh yeah, this is his son. Oh, we'll go. Uh, I'm, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. my fault. This is his son, Vincent. He sent his son to America to try to clear up this mess over in Casterland. And the American government passed a law saying you couldn't own property unless you're a US citizen. Mm. However, his son Vincent married an American woman who was a citizen. So he was able to try to get this thing put back together again. It failed. But if you ever go out to the Finger Lakes and go to Cape Vincent, okay. they failed. Oh, okay. So if you know where to look, you still find this histogram, but you really got to look for it. And uh, the <laughs> next is a picture I took, and this is all that's left of Lorraine. And I gave this presentation a few years ago, and when I took this picture, I had not noticed it, but Lorraine was, of course, France, who was from Paris. And in the picture is French's auto sales. <laughs> <laughs> now we get to one of the characters that I'm most impressed with, Governor Morris. We all know that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration, mm -hmm. right? Declaration of mm -hmm. Who wrote the Constitution? Now, James Madison is Madison. called the father of the Constitution. And he helped create a lot of the, um, got the parties banging their heads together, getting them to agree to things. But it was Governor Morris of New York that physically wrote the first Constitution. Okay. And he had to take all the information from all their notes and pull this thing together. And it's, you know, it's really amazing if you start studying this. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, and everybody's finally heard of because of the play Hamilton, uh, wanted the president and the US senators voted in for life. Oh, and they had to have a net worth of at least $100,000, which would make them a multi million dollar today. Now, some would argue we still kind of have that in some cases. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was Governor Morris who actually wrote the Constitution. And what I find inspiring is the original draft said, we, the provincial government of Delaware, provincial government of New Jersey, mm -hmm. provincial governor of Pennsylvania, so on and so forth, scratched it over and out, and he wrote, we, the people. Now, that's a major change. You know, and so that, that to me, is, is an inspiration. He's very, very brilliant. Uh, the other thing he did, he, he was a real brainy guy. He got very frustrated with the roads because roads weren't labeled where you were going. So he suggested on the roads post longitude and latitude. And everybody thought this guy's an idiot. What does GPS do today? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, he was also a bit of a rake. As brilliant, as super patriotic as he was, go next if you went fairly. Uh, his mother loaned her house in Bronx, New York, called Morrisania, to the British commanding general when the British took over New York City. His older brother became a major general in the British Army, but he remained a patriot and again wrote our constitution. But he was also a bit of a rake. You'll see that he's lost his left leg. The story at the time, or the official story, is that he was riding a carriage through Philadelphia. Horse went wild, carriage tipped over, his legs shot between the spokes, mangled his legs, had to be amputated. That's the official story. There is reason to believe that's not actually what happened. And I discussed this with the 
uh, executive director of the uh, of the museum and governor of New York. Uh, again, it appears that Governor Morris was quite the ladies' man, uh, particularly attracted to marriage women. And the story goes that he got caught upstairs with the married woman when her husband came home early and jumped out the second story window and that's how he broke his leg. So we don't know for sure that's yeah. true, but it makes a great great story, great classic case of cover up. I have a question. Sure. Were most of these British subjects before the war? Yes. Almost every case. Yeah. Except for Lorraine, of course I said French. was French. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact during the American Revolution a lot of them thought themselves still as British subjects, but they were not giving the rights that the British people had, you know, the whole right, right. Uh, the taxation of their representation and so forth. And many hoped that in the initial year of the war that they would say, okay, fine, you're full yeah. British citizens with all rights. And obviously it didn't happen that way. So anyway, Morris was 27 when he broke his leg. Here are his, his 1809 mansion in Gouverneur, New York, it's not quite what we think of a mansion today, but uh, it still stands as people still living in it. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, there's a blow up of the plaque, which you see in the lower right wall. Oh. There we go. And so he just to be the minister of France and senator from New York and writing the Constitution, he, he's quite a marvel. Of a man, and yet I don't know that we've ever really talked about him. Governor New York? Governor of New York is just east of Watertown. You want to use that as a reference point. Okay. Now, you might recognize this fellow standing on the deck with his hands behind his back. It's Napoleon. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Loray earlier with his French influence. It's another fascinating, fascinating story about the Adirondacks we don't talk about. Uh, when Napoleon conquered Spain, he put his older brother Joseph as king of Spain. But then he lost everything at the Battle of Waterloo. And Napoleon Bonaparte, with his brother Joseph Bonaparte, tried to escape to the United States to come to this French land in the Adirondacks and reestablish themselves. <laughs> when Napoleon got caught, got sent to an island in the middle of the Atlantic. His brother Joseph, however, wore a disguise, left his wife, but brought with him chests of gold for the Spanish treasure. <laughs> and he had built a house in Bordentown, uh, Pennsylvania. It's a suburb of Philadelphia. His builder was Michael Bouvier. Did name Bouvier mean anything like that? <laughs> Jacqueline <laughs> Bouvier Kennedy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's a direct descendant of the fellow that built the house in Borden Town. Wow. And it's a fascinating, it wasn't a fascinating house. It wasn't there anymore. I visited the grounds earlier in the summer. Uh, he actually had tunnels from the house because she's afraid to be assassinated. That he could escape, you know, through tunnels. Mm -hmm. But he also had uh, a hunting camp on this French land that they had hoped to take over near Watertown. And if we go to the next picture, oh, okay, I'll, I'll talk about this now, and then we'll go into the next picture. Uh, Louis Bonaparte left his wife in Europe took on with a, a local girl in America who had an illegitimate daughter. She married a guy whose last name was Benton, and their house still exists. Wow. And again, that's near, uh, uh, came from near Waterton. But there's another amazing reminder of Napoleon Bonaparte in our next picture. This is a lake called Lake Bonaparte. <laughs> And Joseph de Par uh, Bonaparte had a hunting camp there, a hunting mansion. And he would bring people up. And he had Venetian style gondolas on the lake, <laughs> where he would take people around to tour the lake. They would picnic on the islands and be served on gold plate from the Spanish treasury. <laughs> wow. Refresh. 
We're coming across the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. I realize we have the Hudson River, but how did they get these ships into the outer Atlantic? Well, basically, they would uh, sail principally to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the largest city at the time of the American Revolution, but New York was also a decent-sized seaport. Then they would take a, they would sail up the Hudson River to Albany. Uh, then they would, you know, go through rough woods or dugouts or whatever, uh, you know, until you got to the point where things had settled down and then they would come up to St. Lawrence and the rapids in St. Lawrence. But once they got to Lake Ontario, but yeah, it's amazing to think what they built here it was so difficult to get around. Okay. Parish Tavern. Uh, this is just north and east of, of Watertown. And in my book, I reference this, that this would make a great James Bond. <laughs> Uh, David Parrish, uh, he uh, traveled in the international circles and he was playing a game of whist. It's a mm -hmm. card game that's very popular in the 1800s. Well, Talleyrand, who was the minister from France, and Talleyrand let loose that Napoleon was going to do something and that was then going to trigger the British to increase the blockade in Europe, which meant that goods from the West Indies would skyrocket in price. So Talleyrand, with Parrish, cornered the market on goods that would be coming in. You know, they got insider information, basically. They knew what was going to happen, understood what the political ramifications would be. Uh, but even more important, David Parrish, who whetted his appetite, it's what's called the Great Silver Scheme of 1806. Uh, in 1806, the government was printing paper money, which was virtually worthless. They didn't have any silver to mint coins. They're using what's called Spanish dollars. In fact, if you've ever looked at an old Spanish dollar, it can be broken into four pieces. That's where our quarter comes from. It's a quarter of a Spanish dollar, 25 cents. But the government didn't have enough silver to, to print, or to print, to, to, to mint coins. Meanwhile, the Spanish are taking all this silver from Mexico to bring it into Spain. <laughs> David Parrish heard that the agent that was supposed to okay the ships leaving port in Mexico had died, but they didn't know it in Mexico. So we had a fellow drops off as an imposter, obviously fluent, fluent in Spanish, and he went to Mexico and he signed off and authorized all these ships laden with Mexican silver on their way to Mexico. However, when they got to the Gulf of Mexico, they took a hard left <laughs> for New Orleans. And David, this silver provided four times the annual demand for the U.S. Wow. Treasury. Wow. <laughs> and David Parrish got 6%. <laughs> so just even trying to see it. Yeah. Now, soon after that, Napoleon is is in, in attacking Europe. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, let's see where I got here in my notes. Uh, and Parrish sees another opportunity with the Napoleonic Wars because Napoleon attacked Spain and destroyed their sheep industry, the Marino's sheep there. It just destroyed it. But they needed all these wool uniforms. So they all wore wool, wool uniforms for the military back then. So the price of wool, Zor, exploded, especially merino wool. So David Parrish snuck merino sheep from Spain and Portugal to northern New York for on 700,000 acres of land that he owned. And he built a house there. And uh, here is a, a letter that I found. This was in the collection of St. Lawrence University. And uh, Carol and I was laughing about this. My wife was helping me do this stuff. We'll go through pages of pages and pages of these old letters. And I'll say to her, is this an S? Is this an F? What is this word? <laughs> you know, and we're, you're going through stuff. It's the you know, mundane stuff, trying to find that little kernel of information that you're really trying to hope for. 
But if we go on to the next picture, in 1800, David Parrish built a house. There's an old picture of it. I don't know if he's in this picture or not. Uh, but uh, that house, uh, let's see, here we go. Okay, anyway, since we're talking. Uh, he did very well with that house it was during the War of 1812. In addition to that, to build his wealth, he personally guaranteed, with a few other people, $12 million of U.S. loans, basically mm -hmm. co-signed for the U.S. government, mm -hmm. said the money was good because the government was borrowing money in Europe. Uh, the government defaulted. <laughs> so he was on the fuck for all this money, and he had all these sheep. And then the Napoleonic Wars end, and suddenly they don't need all this wool from uniforms anymore. Mm -hmm. And the Spanish sheep industry comes roaring back. Uh, so mm -hmm. he's in his house. If you look at his next picture, you might recognize it. It's today the Remington Art Museum. That's David Parrish's house in Ogdensburg, New York. And uh, he found himself destitute, uh, went back to Europe, went to Germany, and drowned himself in the Danube River. And again, that's now the Remington Art Museum. Okay. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you folks the history of Lake Placid or Wilmington. I, I know better than to, to, to do that. But I may share a little information you may or may not know. Uh, about the year 1800, there was something called New York Fever, where a lot of folks from Vermont mm -hmm. came across the lake. Mm -hmm. The reason they did that is they had large families. Mm -hmm. The eldest would get the farm. And the rest of the kids say, hey, you're on your own, good luck. Mm -hmm. And the Adirondacks were so much cheaper. So they came across uh, over to this side of, of the lake. And Elijah Bennett moved here from Orwell, Vermont, to North Elba. He built a little house where today is the outflow from Mirror Lake. Mm -hmm. And that used to be called Bennett's Pond. And just below that, uh, down the stream of that, was the iron and steel manufacturing company. This is an 1812 uh, stock certificate yeah. from that company just down the Chubb River from uh, the pond. We'll go to our next one, which is a picture of Archibald McIntyre in 1809. He was the controller of the state of New York with partners established iron works at the dam on the Chubb River, just south of Bennett's house. He hired Bennett because Bennett was a blacksmith. Well, the area was threatened during World War, or the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Bennett, who had actually fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill originally, came to the defense of Plattsburgh in the War of 1812. They said he was frosty haired at age 60. Wow. But he responded to the British incursion in, in Plattsburgh at that time. And he returned to Vermont in 1812 when the ironworks shut down, but they came back to North Elba in 1820 when the works reopened. So a lot of the settlers, the point I'm trying to make for this area came from, came from Vermont. Our next interesting character is John Brown. Uh, this is not the John Brown of North Elba that tried to free the slaves at Harper's Ferry. This is John Brown of Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, he was born in 1736, and his family had a fleet of ships out of Providence, and they made their money bringing slaves from Africa to the United States, something that Brown University doesn't like to acknowledge, because some of that money meant to found Brown University years later. Uh, he also sent some ships to the Orient, and they came back laden with tea and coffee and all sorts of spices. One of the bigger ones was a ship called George Washington, and it tied up in New York City. And he sent his son down there to collect what was owed there. And the son came back with a quick claim deed to thousands of acres in the other mm -hmm. And supposedly the story goes that John Brown put his head on his desk and just cried uh, because there were issues with that land. And I actually had an opportunity to meet with a descendant of John Brown 
and they call the Adronics the curse of the family <laughs> because the difficulties they have. Yeah. Now, the next picture, mm -hmm. I think, is a picture of his mansion in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Very nice, open to public tour. And as I say, he wound up with his uh, these thousands of acres with a quick claim deed. Uh, and he tried to set up an iron mine near Thendora in today's Old Forge. Mm -hmm. you know, Old Forge, mm -hmm. Iron Mine Forge. But it continually flooded. And they could never make it profitable. So it really became a, a curse on the family. Now, on a side to that is uh, in Old Forge. We'll see. I have to place you may recognize this as you drive oh, by mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, I, in front of the Old Forge Hardware, there's a couple of monuments and stuff to John Brown and uh, attempts for an iron ore mine there. Well, what I find just across the street from this is a, is a plaque. I began my talk about the beavers and how they were so heavily harvested in the 1600s. And by the time you get to 1900, there's mm -hmm. supposedly only 15 individual beavers in the Adirondacks. Oh, so they introduced 20 beavers in 1900 from Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. And all the beavers we have today are descendants of those 20 beavers mm -hmm. that were dropped off right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For better or worse. There or today. Not in my backyard. Now in your backyard. They're blowing out our roads when we get too much rain. Uh, next individual that's fascinated is probably of Gilliland. And this you might be related to because yeah. it's with, uh, closer to you with Lake uh, Champlain. He, during the French Indian War, he served in His Majesty's 35th Regiment of Foot, who was possibly, possibly stationed at Fort Tuggeroga. Can't document that for sure. He made a fortune as a successful New York City merchant. And then he returned to Champlain, first built a log cabin, then 1766, a baronial estate with six miles of lake frontage in Willsboro. Property is three to four miles deep and a total of 3,500 acres. He added 4,500 acres, including the modern town of Westport. And he ran it under what was called the patroon system. You know, very much uh, English. You know, I'm the aristocrat and all you peasant mm -hmm. farmers can pay me a little bit every year. And uh, that incited resentment against him. Mm -hmm. So although he personally funded a regiment of 3,500 men to fight with Arnold when they attacked Quebec, Arnold was still part of the American cause at that point. There was enough resentment that uh, after the war, he was uh, uh, jailed and his properties ransacked. And we've got uh, the next picture here. This is a map in 1762. And on the left hand side, about halfway up, you can see Gilliland's Mill. Uh, but just above that is what well, I thought was interesting uh, lead mine. And this was this map was about the time of the American Revolution. Why was lead important? That's what they made musket balls out of. So it's amazing you go through these old maps, you can pull information out that uh, you might not otherwise be aware of. Okay, coming near the end here. Uh, one thing with Champlain that's interesting is until the Champlain Canal came in, all the ship traffic headed north. Headed north towards Montreal. They couldn't go south. There's no way to go south. But when they put the canal in, that all the traffic turned around and could go down to New York City. So it was a major change in the economy of the area. And it was completed in 1823. So there was infrastructure improvements being done uh, because they saw this, the uh, run access and economic engine. This is one of those canal boats I talked about and referenced that would they would pull, obviously pull the mass down <laughs> and then go down the canals. They could be going down to New York City as a result. Now, one of the proponents of the Champlain Canal was John Thurman. And it was my curiosity about John <laughs> Thurman that originally started the search as far as what would happen in the area after the American Revolution. John Thurman was a merchant of New York. I got a picture up here. This was what we think he looked like. He was a merchant of New York, born in 1830. His father was an Englishman. Uh, 
a baker, but a special kind of baker. He used to bake what's called ship's bread. That was bread that they could put on a ship and it wouldn't spoil right away, you know, because they were going to volumes just they had to keep it for a longer time. More importantly, his mother was Elizabeth Wells. No, Wells, Wells, W E S S E L S, right? Okay. Uh, she was of Dutch descent. The parents had come here in the 1600s and they owned a lot of land in New York City. Um, Now, the next picture we'll see is, are, are any folks originally from New York or spent any time in New York? Okay. Uh, here is, if you look at the, about the center where it says ward and then there's a space and a D, there's a little C past that. That was the Dutch Reformed Church on Garden Street. And John Thurman was taught in Dutch. But, of course, his father was English, so he could speak both languages. But, and if you notice, this is old enough, you can see that the ship has a uh, British Union Jack on it on this particular map. Mm -hmm. uh, if we go to the next one, we'll see a, a scene in New York, which you may not recognize. Mm -hmm. Anybody spend time in New York? Mm -hmm. This okay. is the World Trade Center ferry terminal. Mm -hmm. This was John Thurman's wharf mm -hmm. when the mail boats used to come down from Albany they would stop here. So this is on the Hudson River. The next slide shows a different wharf on the other side. Oh, excuse me. This is where you see Trinity Church. Uh, on the corner there was William Street. He had a dry goods store. And on the East River, he had another wharf between the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges today. And things would arrive from Europe. They'd go to his dry goods store. And then they'd exchange them, and then they'd go down to the wharf and attend the Hudson River. So he made a lot of money. He was quite wealthy. And you don't think of somebody who would find Johnsburg, which mm -hmm. if you drew the Johnsburg, is not much there. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the uh, the founding of it. Uh, let's see, I'm skipping ahead here. Well, in 1775, John Thurman began speculating in lands in the great northern wilderness, as it was then called. And here we have in the state archives in Albany, a deed. And you see that little clay thing there. That was kind of like the notary public of the day. That was the king's seal mm -hmm. to show that he paid taxes on the land he had purchased. Mm -hmm. And he started buying his land in, 17, in December of 1775. Now, if that strikes anybody's unusual, <laughs> well, you realize that six months later, there was a war going on. And in January of uh, 76, we go to the next picture. In his letter book, I came across this. Now, they didn't have carbon paper back then. So when you send a letter to somebody, you would have your secretary or you yourself would make a copy in your letter book of what the letter you sent. So you know what you sent when you sent it. Well, this is all in code. If you can see way up the top, it says Albany, 26th of January, 1776. We have no idea what this says. No one's ever broken this code. So we don't know whether he was loyal to the British. Well, 1672 is right there. Yeah, but I, he must be referencing something, or that could be code too. But if you look way up the top, it says Albany, 26th of January, 1776. Uh, we have no idea which side. He was on. There were a lot of people, business people, especially in New York, caught betwixt in between. Uh, Is this the spelling of Schenectady? I think that could very well be to William Campbell in Schenectady. Yeah, Schenectady. Mm -hmm. So, and when the uh, the Patriots kind of took over New York City, the governor went out on a ship, well, the British governor, for his own protection. So the, nobody was administering the city of New York. So they formed a committee of 100, which 100 responsible citizens to actually manage New York City. And John Thurman is one of those selected. So he's well respected locally, but again, we don't really know which side he was on. And uh, I discovered in Johnsburg, uh, he, his development, if I can call it that, which is very modest uh, for the time, uh, 
found his own foundations and so forth. And my this first book actually won an award from the 35 upstate uh, County Historical Society because I noted all sites, 55 historic sites with GPS coordinates mm -hmm. because in many cases, nature is covering these places mm -hmm. over and they're hard to find, which we'll see if we go to the next picture. I think I got a picture of his ruins from his house. And unless you know where to look, you ain't gonna mm -hmm. find it. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though it's, it was so important in its day. Now, uh, Thurman did just speculate in lands here, like some people did. He tried to develop them. He owned much of northern Warren County, northern Washington County, and parts of southern Essex County. Mm -hmm. And uh, our next picture is an 1810 grist mill in East Hartford, Washington County, New York. Oh. We don't know for sure this was actually on mm -hmm. Thurman's property, but it's indicative of what a grist mill would look like in this area in 1810. The next picture shows some of the internal workings of that mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. leather belts and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing he did for the next picture, he uh, did something pretty unusual. He had grist mills, sawmills, he had a potash, right? He used potash was the first cash crop for the settlers in the area. Also had a rye distillery, supposedly he drank it all, they didn't uh, export it. But in 1790, he converted his woolen mill to a calico printing mill. It's the first one in New York State, according to my research at the uh, Native Textile Museum in uh, um, Lowell, Massachusetts. It's the seventh in the United States. Why would he build this? <laughs> <clears throat> in Johnsburg, I don't know. <laughs> he probably got some land for it, but uh, we actually have a, a picture next of a piece of calico who is said to have been printed oh, at that mill. Oh, oh, oh. And this is cotton. Why build a cotton printing mill in the middle of the other islands? We don't grow cotton in here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Most of the cotton apparently came from Savannah and up to New York City, then maybe up to Albany. Wow. But even then, north of Albany, it's really not navigable at a time when most commercial things are by water. Wow. Why would you wind up you know, more, near where it says Gore Mountain is for a calico printing? But it definitely was there. Was the made, then? We don't know. We suspect mm. it came up as bales of cotton mm. and may have been made into fabric in New York City. Mm -hmm. And then they shipped the fabric up to be printed up here. It, but it defies logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then we have it all was an old paint bed mine. I thought, well, maybe they used the pigments from that. But no, they didn't. We checked that and that's not what they used. Uh, these are basically agricultural pigments, not mm -hmm. from the ground. Um, so that's one of the great mysteries, which with all the research I've done, I still don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, last, right. get towards the end of our talk, Gary. Um, we talked about things disappearing in the woods, mm -hmm. why we need GPS coordinates. Uh, William Johnson had his home in Johnstown. If you ever get a chance to go to Johnstown, it's worth, worth a visit. It's, it's impressive for the history there. But he also had a fishing camp, and he loved to fish. And so alongside the uh, Sakandaga Lake, uh, is this sign, mm -hmm. and so I took it upon myself to try to figure out where the, this fishing camp actually was and determined it was on a small knoll overlooking the Sacandega River before it was up, just south of the confluence with the Vi Creek. So I got a topo map of the underside of the bottom of Sacandega Lake, and the next slide is the location of that historic site today. See the star? <laughs> it's in the water. Wow. It's somehow being called mm -hmm. Fish Creek. It just adds to the adds to the whole thing. So that I don't think is it, is there any more? Is there another picture? Maybe one more. Oh, okay. Yes, it's the last one. Thank you for your patience, especially with the heat. The receptors are here. Um, this was the book I came out with. Uh, it was my second book. They talked about these 13 sites. 
had uh, 1,500 printed in 2014, sold out in about three years. It is out of print. You can't buy any tonight. I'd love to sell it. Okay. Uh, but sometimes on eBay, you can find a used one. Yeah, I bought one. They did. Good mm -hmm. for you. Good for you. Uh, the original price was $18.95, I think. And I've seen the price as much as $100. I don't know why you might pay that for it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and the one thing I take some pride in, the book had to be reviewed by four PhDs in history before it was submitted. And it was nominated in the 2014 American Association of State and Local History Leadership Award. It was a national finalist. So I was very pleased with that. So that concludes my talk. Uh, Thank you, Karen, and everybody for helping with the projection. Thank you. Thank you. I've heard a lot of Karen's right but I've left you with any one idea is that there were things happening in the Adirondacks after the American Revolution that nobody talks about. Do you have any questions? Yeah, please go ahead. The uh, Macomb Purchase is a major purchase in northern and western that affected this area greatly. Yes. Uh, what was the history of that, and basically? I don't have all the details on that. Uh, I mean, it kind of ties in with the, the mining history that we experience here in the United States. Uh, and I read about it, but I don't have all the details at my fingertips right now. But uh, it was hard. I mean, when people have written books, yeah. you got to keep putting the blinders on because you can go off on so Animals. many tangents. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I didn't want a you know eighteen hundred page book, but that one obviously is very important. Alexander, he had a influence, and a, the French influence came in with him in, in that, that region. Okay. Uh, so you, you kind of skirted the Adirondacks, mm -hmm. and this is the piece up at the top. Sure. Is that where the Palm Park is? What's that? The Palm Park the State Park. Yes, that's what it's named yeah. after, but. I don't think we appreciate how strong the French influence was mm -hmm. for so long in this area. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I love walking through woods and coming across old foundations and trying to say, who lived here? What was it like? You know? mm -hmm. And especially if you do any walking like that, uh, the thing to watch for is old apple trees, lilac trees, wow. maybe a butternut tree, because those weren't native. <laughs> So it's sometimes a clue there's something else going on there. So I do have two of my other books, just a, a quick advertisement here. This was my first book that was sold out. And last year I did a reprint uh, and expanded it to 500 pages. It's basically 55 historic sites in the township of Johnsburg, which is where I live by Warren Mountain, which ties in a lot of Adirondack history, but it's more specific to Johnsburg. Mm -hmm. And then a quick story about this. Uh, my middle name is Lincoln, not not uh, related, I don't think, in any way to the president. But uh, as we started approaching the uh, commemoration of the uh, 250th, 150th anniversary of the Civil War, I began to question, how is this area involved? You know, how, you know, usually connect New York State you know, Civil War, but there had to be some connections. So I checked all sorts of places, including the Adirondack Museum, and nobody had anything. Our local history, uh, historic group knew nothing. So I went on a mission and using uh, enlistment records, death certificates, graveyard sites, regimental histories, I determined from our little town of Johnsburg, 175 men served in the Civil War. And I did a two hour lecture in our community uh, Paul mm -hmm. holds about 150 people with 100 historic pictures uh, talking about these individuals and the battles mm -hmm. they fought mm -hmm. and what it was like and what it was like for the people back home. And after I gave that presentation, I had a lot of people come up to me and say, Glenn, you got to write about this. You got to make a book out of this. Mm -hmm. And I said, first of all, we don't need another book on the Adirondacks. And we certainly don't need another book on the Civil War. So, and a book on the Civil War about the Adirondacks is no, it's not going to happen. So, two years later, I wrote When Mountains Meet. But on November 2nd, uh, 2014, I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep, tossing and turning. And I just had these images in my mind. And I went to my computer 
I had 10 weeks worth of novels. Wow. I could not sleep. Now, it took me a year to edit it yeah. afterwards. But I had these, I would write from two o'clock to five o'clock in the morning, get an hour or two of sleep, and then go to work for the night. I did that for 10 weeks. My wife said I was an utter zombie. <laughs> but uh, this basically is, is a novel, short novel about not just the Civil War, but more importantly, what it was like back on the farm when the men and boys were off fighting and how the women had to chop the wood and you know plant the crops and harvest the crops and keep the fire going and you know and the accidents on the farm and all this kind of stuff so that was that was fun to me so good well if you think of other questions later carrie can track me down thank you very much for being here this evening and, uh, back to the women do you have do you have anything in your research of what you've done and these other these gentlemen that you've done about the women involved with in these that? master mm -hmm. type thing, not too much it was a different society back then they may have done something behind the scenes mm -hmm. i mean clearly Lorraine's wife as being part of the queen's court helped him get all his money and getting it get his appointment as the financial minister mm -hmm. for the king the gorgeous wife was the fallen woman from virginia yeah yes randolph right exactly yeah. Story. Oh, that's uh, the, the scandals that go on with some of these people. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's fun, fun, and that's what I love about history. You are real people. You know, you dig deep enough. I, I dislike taking history courses in high school. I didn't take many in college. Okay. Uh, I, I just, I, I was just bored to death with it. Uh, but on my own, I just started. I, I used to drive my mother crazy because I'd hear about something. I said. Why is it? Did it really happen that way? And so why did it happen that way? And that's what this all led to. Yes. I don't know if this is true, but we live in Riverview and uh, we live in the township of Blackburn. And I started doing a lot of reading, and you probably tell me if this is true or not. That during the Civil War, the way the county got its name Blackbrook is that they they mined so much iron ore for the Civil War and they dumped all their stuff into the brooks, and the brooks turned black. Could very well be the uh, the the, the uh, Union uh, monitor, you know, the Merrimack and the monitor was built in Troy with iron ore that came from the Adirondacks. Yeah. So that could very well be the case. Yes, yeah. from Palmer Hill. Wow, from Palmer from Palmer Hill. <laughs> the iron for the Merrimack. Monitor. Monitor. Was the monitor. Was from, from, from Merrimack was the Confederate. Ship. Correct. The monitor was a Yankee ship. Correct. Yeah. That but was that mined was... in this area and probably processed in Clintonville, just down the road here. But, but there were a bunch of scattered mines all around at the time. Sure. Different areas, small ones. Right. Yeah. But they panned out once they cut all the trees down with charcoal. Oh, the charcoal. Yeah. Yeah. And sure. the sure. Sure. Open and sure. the arrows came off the sleeve. I love giving these talks. I get as much yeah. information for new people as I yeah. try to give out. We all learn together. That's great. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.